Hi, and welcome to the 12th Annual North American Leadership Forum, Bringing Investments into the Airport of the Future. My name is Gregory Wong. I'm the Vice President of North America for CCR Airports, and I've been monitoring today's panel. Today, we have a select group of industry leaders who will share their thoughts on how to bring investments to airports in these uncertain times. First, I'd like each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Frank, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, my name's Frank Patton, and I've been uh, uh, working on this project, the Great Lakes Basin Transportation. It's a combination of a greenfield airport, a greenfield highway, and a greenfield railroad. Great, um, thanks. Thanks, well, I mean, going, some of the others, are you going to introduce everybody first? Yeah, let, let's have each 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 panelist introduce yourself. Jorge, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, th thank you, Greg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jorge Roberts, uh, CEO of Airports. Uh, we're an airport operator uh, manager operating uh, eight U.S. airports today. Uh, we're owned by uh, a fund that's managed by uh, Goldman Sachs Infrastructure and uh, been in the uh, public-private partnership of airports uh, last 13 years. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jorge. And John? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is John Carver. I'm Executive Director of Project Development for CCR Airports. Um, I've been uh, with the firm for about six months as the uh, company continues to expand its portfolio here in the U.S. Uh, prior to my involvement with CCR, I was a deputy executive director at uh, Los Angeles World Airports, and prior to that, had been in the private sector on the maritime side. So uh, I have brought sort of a, a combined experience of both being on the Port Authority side and, uh, and on the private sector side. Happy to be on the panel. Great. Thanks, John. So, Frank, let's start with you. So based on your experience, What's the right formula to bring private investments to airport projects? Okay, I think what you have to do is you have to appeal to a private investor and understand that whoever the investor is has lots of competing projects uh, that they're looking at. And so it, to me, there's two things. Is one is how you position the project and more importantly, what kind of returns can the investor uh, look forward to uh, if he invests in the airport? Um, as an example, the uh, if you talk about a greenfield airport, it's a lot different type of investor than if you talk about a modernization of a current airport. Um, and in both cases, uh, that investor will have uh, different different attitudes about whether he's putting his money or locking it up for three to five years or even longer, or if if I invest in this modernization of the airport, uh, how fast before my dollars can start earning revenue and I can get a return. Uh, the key that we've been looking at for a long time is uh, some advice my grandfather gave to me many, many years ago. And he said, you got to leave a dollar on the table for the other guy. If you pride yourself on squeezing every last penny out of a project, uh, no matter who signs the contract, uh, it does not, in my opinion, bode well for the future. So if you're a local community and you want to find investors to upgrade your airport, that's great. But you got to look at it with, from their viewpoint as much as yours and try and work out an accommodation. Great. Thank, thanks, Frank. And, 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 and Jorge, um, you know, Norm, Norm Wright wrote this op-ed the other day about the five forces defining the infrastructure landscape. He talked about one, prioritizing private investment, two, unleashing digital in the innovation, three, creating public sector agility, four, engaging users, users through benefits, and five, vision. How do you think these five principles apply to the airport sector? Yeah, no, thank you, Greg. Uh, and just following up with what Frank said, you know, I think uh, what Norm lays out is is a is a good blueprint on on potentially how to uh, rank, uh, you know, both countries and 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 areas of of a country uh, in terms of their uh, opportunities for investment in airports. I think that these five forces that that he speaks about, uh, you know, prioritizing private investment, uh, it's it's about you know risk transfer. 
from uh, the authorities or, or public entities being going from being an operator to regulator, regulator uh, bringing in that innovation, efficiencies, uh, that decision making that comes from you know from a commercial mindset and uh, and shielding from these political decisions, right? So um, I think there you know and there's a there's role of equity uh, in financing where you, you if you just use debt, then uh, you're exposed to uh, downturns where you know an, a private investor can actually come in and inject capital when when it's needed. It creates that finance additional layer of financeability and uh, and sustainability. I think on the second piece of unleashing digital innovation, you know we're in the age of accelerated innovation. Uh, in the long term, you know you're going to see you know autonomous vehicles, remote operations, ramp towers. Uh, in the medium term, you know there's been a lot of talk I think at the conference too about 5G. And, uh, and the impact there, but you're going to start seeing, you know, redesign kind of passenger experiences with security checkpoints, health checkpoints, uh, and then the use of augmented reality, for example, that's a technology that we're starting to implement to allow personnel to have, you know, right away information and, and, and be able to, to, to remotely uh, tackle um, situations or, 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 or operations. Um, the third part about creating public sector agility um, when you involve the private sector, uh, it could come through different forms. Uh, it depends on the, uh, how much risk that the, uh, the, the authority or the public entity wants to share. Uh, but with, with more risk that you would lay on to a private uh, investor, um, you, you should give them uh, you know, more reward, right? And I agree with Frank that that uh, reward should be shared and, and those risks should be shared. Um, and, and regardless, you know, we the, uh, any airport, regardless of its financial condition, could benefit from private sector, right? Even lo money losing airports, we've taken over some of those airports and made them profitable. So creating that, you know, gives them that agility uh, to to manage these public infrastructure. And number four, when we say engage users through benefits that that Norm talks about. It's super critical for these projects to, to get off the ground and even to, to actually work over the long term, getting that community alignment with all the stakeholders, the community and both at the airport, you have a lot of stakeholders uh, such as airlines and agencies and everybody has to be aligned. But it starts off with the community. And I think last, as Norm said, with vision, if, if there has to be political leadership here. And, and there has to be a political champion and a sponsor uh, because otherwise uh, it's it's been very difficult. I'm talking about the U.S. right and uh, and what 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 could be needed and we can talk about kind of other how, how what what public authorities need to think about uh, to to attract that private sector innovation. But I think it's an initial good blueprint as an investor. If I would see those five forces, um, it would allow me to allow us to to, to prioritize where we should focus first and, and where are the conditions for uh, a, a hospitable and sustainable uh, private investment. Great, thanks Jorge. And John, over to you. So, um, you know, given the current environment with the COVID-19, the current pandemic, obviously the operating conditions of all airports have changed with passenger numbers going down. So from a, from the, you know, coming from the public sector and now being on the private sector, where do you see the private sector's role is in terms of future-proofing airports? Yeah, let me um, let me maybe, let me just start with sort of a state of where the P3 activity is today. I think that's a good bridge into that um, that future-proofing conversation. You know, I, I prefer the term alternative delivery to P3 because anything other than a traditional uh, inclusion of a project within a capital improvement program falls into the category of alternative delivery. And P3 means different things to different people. Uh, and some of the DBFOM type projects we see today are are not exactly P3 models. Uh, the, um, you know, the activities that, uh, and the, the projects that we see, I've seen uh, undertaken over the last few years in this sector continue to be refined. And uh, they're evolving as, you know, as airports and the commissioners and the other stakeholders are learning lessons from the previous partnerships. You know, I think Frank was involved in some of the early P3s, and there's a lot of lessons from from those pioneers that are now being refined in terms of of um, how they're structured and the risk allocation, et cetera. Um, I do agree. There is an abundance of capital out there. Uh, I think airports need not be 
Chai um, based on uh, the other investments that capital is looking at. Um, you know, U.S. transportation infrastructure, even in this kind of uncertain time we're coming out of, still is at the top of the triangle when you look at, at uh, major investment opportunities. And it's a lot easier for, uh, for certain capital interests to deploy, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, as opposed to, you know, tenfold of $50 million projects. So airport projects tend to be, uh, in many cases, on the larger side. So there's still a, a quite a bit of an appetite for some of the things that, 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 that we need to see done. You know, where P3s have come in the last few years, I think, you know, the first generation of these really began overseas and they were pure privatization. And privatization is sort of a taboo word here in the US for uh, at least among airports. And the FAA is not real fond on that either. So we're trying to get away, I think, from the idea that a P3 is a privatizing of an airport. Um, you know, the second phase of P3 uh, or alternative delivery sort of revolved around availability payments. And I think now um, um, as a result of COVID in, in part, you know, those are gonna be more scrutinized in the future. Projects that were based on traffic volumes and passenger volumes and car rental volumes uh, um, with an availability payment at the end of the day, I think are gonna be tougher to, uh, to rationalize going forward. So, so where I think things are going, is more towards you know a true partnership uh, and that's certainly where where ccr is headed uh towards really um finding that opportunity for the private sector and the public sector to work together uh to um to create the opportunities where there can be a revenue share which can benefit both sides and so you know to focus on the partnership aspect i think is going to be uh really key going forward whatever the project might be now to do that there's got to be an opportunity to monetize whatever the project might be and some just aren't suitable for a p3 type investment because there's no ability to to monetize whatever that project might be but for those that uh, that uh, that can be um, um, developed then i think those uh, represent um, a, a real ripe opportunity for p3 going forward um, you know, airports have the attitude today in many respects that, you know, if it if it adds to the airport, if it can generate revenue, if it can do it with other people's money, then those are the type of things that they're going to be uh, continuing to explore. Great. Thanks. We'll and just on, on this topic about um, structuring the right P3 format and, you know, balancing risk and control at the same time as managing stakeholders, what what sort of advice? And Frank, you know, I know you you do this on a daily basis, but what what are sort of you know some general advice on how how you manage the issues with the who the different stakeholders are and how you manage this this balance between risk risk and control? Um, if I can address that, the uh, the risk always gets down to uh, what's your economic model. Uh, what are your growth projections? What are your revenue projections? Uh, when can we start seeing returns to the initial shareholders? Um, that kind of thing. And so my advice would be that, uh, and again, we get back to the two types. Do we talk about a greenfield airport or we talk about a quote modernization? Uh, the ideas that are going around about modernization include, and here I want to make sure I cover all this when I get my notes. But one of the things is, what's, what is the revenue model for the future for airports, any airport? Um, and there are all sorts of ideas going around, but, but what you hear constantly is this whole growth of Amazon and now FedEx is getting in there and UPS and Target and Macy's and whatever. And they're all, they're moving away from having one airport for a whole metropolitan area to having what they call point to point. And there's examples, uh, several, one of them in Florida at Lakeland, where they had this old sleepy rural airport, all of a sudden overnight it became a, one of Amazon's uh, largest distribution airports. Uh, if the consumer wants to order something online, the big deal is how fast can I get it? And the, the networks that 
are needed to support that. Uh, either you say, okay, we'll have these massive warehouses, uh, and they are massive now, but, but the whole idea is you can't just stock those with anything and everything and then hope over a period of time that it'll get moved. The key is when somebody wants something, if you don't have it, you got to get it to, if you don't have it down the block, you got to get it to them as fast as possible. And that's where all these regional airports come in. The second trend is to make the airport itself a destination so that if you have a good transit system to the airport, in other words, it doesn't take you two hours to drive to the airport. Well, who's going to do that if they're not going on a flight? But if you can get there in 15 minutes or half an hour, and you say, there's some terrific restaurants at the airport, and one, I can go there without having to go through security in a flight. That's the biggest thing. And then the second is, you know, let's do it. Uh, what also happens, it's happened to me several times, people come to O'Hare and they say, gee, I've got a two hour lay layover. Where can we meet? Well, if I meet them in the airport, I got to go through security. And if I don't have a ticket, there's only so far I can go. So that's evolving too. And each one of those, uh, in my mind, offers opportunities, but you just can't say, okay, well, we're going to go out and raise all this money so we can build some restaurants and have them so people can come to them. You've got to have a payout. You've got to have all the stuff that an investment banker would ask. And, and I think, if, in my parting advice, is there's a lot of public uh, documents out there. Uh, one, in, uh, one airport in particular, Rickenbacker in Ohio, where it's run by a public entity, and you can actually come up with some economic models based on that airport. Um, uh, there are others in the country, and if somebody wants to talk to me about them, I'd be glad to do it. But you also have to have a firmly committed public acceptance. Uh, and in my case, um, there's terrific. There's terrific people who are behind the airport in the public sector, and what they need is someone to say, okay, we've got the public support, now let's go to the private thing figure out what the returns are and let's go to work. And that's really what, where I am with my project right now. Great. And Jorge, I know you, you, know, you manage a lot of, as a private company, you manage a lot of public airports on behalf of the, uh, you know, the, the owners there. So this, this balancing act of, you know, risk, risk and, and control and, and how to manage stakeholders, how, in your experience, you know, how have you, manage that and, and what sort of advice can you give? Sure. No, thank you, Greg. And just to build on what Frank and John uh, were mentioning, uh, you know, I think you, you know, for us, uh, it all starts from you know understanding the objectives of the public authority. Um, one of the things that we we pride ourselves is that uh, we're, we're flexible in terms of how we come into the investment, right? So from the very low part of, of an O&M, just doing an O&M, plus plus to all the way a full privatization. And, uh, and it all depends on, on, on what the community is, is, uh, is able or amenable to. Um, sometimes you have to start with an O&M structure and then eventually graduate into a, P, into a P3. Um, but but you can already start injecting that private sector innovation and, and efficiencies in, into an asset, uh, and and we can you know do ultra, you know investments on the side uh, to finance uh, you know capex on uh, all the way from an availability payment we can do that all the way to to a return. So there's not one size fit, fits all. Um, there there is there's already a, a structure in the U.S. the FA, FA uh, airport Improvement Partnership Program, which is uh, 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 evolved from the pilot privatization program, and that's been one model that some airports have tried, and uh, most of them have been unsuccessful, uh, with the exception of San Juan. Uh, we're involved right now in Air Glades, is, is the only project going through the privatization program. Uh, but, but nonetheless, within out of that, there's alternatives, ways to, to structure this. And it's not just about you know, delivering infrastructure, but it's beyond that, right? It's to reduce the total cost of ownership, de-risk the investment, for for whether it's up front or later down the road, it's just uh, we in, in the case of ourselves, we're we're patient, we're flexible, and uh, and it really depends on 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 the public authorities' uh, kind of risk appetite. But we we're convinced that uh, we can make pretty much every any airport work. 
So I know it's an innovative idea because most investors in this sector are very focused on, well, it has to be one, one way or the other. But in the U.S., it's just not going to work. I think in the U.S., public authorities are very, um, the, the word privatization or private investment, it scares them a lot. And, uh, and for the mo longest part, they, you know, they just didn't need it, right? Because they had access to, to low cost financing uh, and, and they can get away with it. But, but, but in order to be uh, you know, competitive, uh, they're gonna have to inject private sector uh, efficiencies and innovation and, and when needed investment. So, and, and that's where uh, companies like us can play. Right, yeah, thanks, if, if I could maybe add, add to that, 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 that comment about cost of capital is key, right? Because I think most airports began sort of poo-pooing P3 and alternative delivery models because they recognized that their cost of capital was lower uh, than the private sector. But, uh, but it's this issue of risk that, that we're talking about is what gets them back to the table. And the, um, you know, the construction risk, the scheduling risk, the cost escalation risk, the commercial risk, those are the things that are driving the, the, the uh, airports to the table to have these kind of conversations. So, the, you know, and, and I think it was said earlier, you know, the more risk that the private sector partner can take on, the more attractive that project is to uh, the airport uh, authority, as, as the case may be. And I think you're right, John, if I might enter just to add to you, um, when, when, when the, the focus has been too much on that cost of capital, I agree. And so, but once you layer it in and you layer on that the total cost of ownership will be low under private, you know, uh, partnership or, or investment or operation. Uh, and then you layer in that, hey, it just requires a, some level of equity, but the majority is going to be debt. When you all add it all up, the, the cost, the blended cost is going to be much lower than than just focusing on on just what the cost of capital and I, I completely agree with you john so that that's where the conversation needs to change in, in public authorities and be open to to having this this discussion right yes and and I, I think that the uh, uh i agree with uh, john and, uh, and jorge on the uh the risk factor and my experience is that's one thing that the developer has to educate the public, his public partners on, that um, uh, you know, I say, well, gee, I, I'm, I, you know, I have some public position here, and I think this airport's going to go great. So why should why should I have to give up more than seven percent or eight percent, which is what a triple B bond gives, and and what is lost in that conversation is the the risks that Jorge just mentioned. And John as well. You know, what 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 about if there are building delays? What about if if all of a sudden somebody gets elected and he's against uh, airplanes? You know, everything should be uh, on the highway. I mean, there's extremes all over the place, and the investor is the one that looks at these risks and looks at his capital. And what I've found is it's absolutely imperative that you have to find long-term investors that if somebody wants to invest in an airport or a highway or a railroad uh, and their usual window is I want to get my return in, in two to three years, that's the wrong, they're the wrong folks to be talking to. Um, and this is where, unfortunately, for the United States of America, the investors who have much longer term outlooks are all abroad, uh, both in Europe and in Asia. And there they see the wisdom and they say, well, if it takes 10 years or 20 years for us to get a return, as long as we can maintain the value of the investment uh, and it will ride with whatever the inflation rate is. And then once it turns the corner and starts producing revenue, um, then we're going to come out very well. And I think that's if you go to the international market, that's a story that you not only have to tell but you have to document uh and uh you know it's crystal ball stuff and you can say well who's got the clearest crystal ball well nobody does you know how many people saw the virus coming but i will say to the naysayers in aviation that uh after the tragedy of 9 11 everybody thought that commercial aviation was going to be in the tank for a long time and it 
turned out that that fortunately was not the case. So in, in that respect, and, and I think we're all, you know, in the airport uh, industry and we, we've always, you know, experienced boom in terms of uh, passenger traffic. And now with this COVID-19, we've seen passengers level decrease and a lot of the capital plans for airport owners have been based on a, a on a growing traffic pattern in terms of passenger numbers. So as 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 airports, you know, look to start to modernize the airports from an op- airport's owner's perspective, you know, having you know interact with a lot of airports, what 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 kind of advice and, and what do you see uh how do you see airports just start to prioritize their investment, you know, going to post COVID? world uh maybe to jorge i'll start with you and then and john and frankie could chime in sure uh you know i think it for for some of them is cash preservation right now uh especially if you have uh you know uh, traffic that uh, l traffic you know traffic is going to come back right uh, people love to travel uh businesses will will have to come back and you know maybe in different forms uh, but but we all can agree that at some point it will come back so i think right now there's prioritization over uh some capital projects that you can actually accelerate if you have the cash and and if you need financing then call us right we, we can we can help you with that and uh and, and we, we've done that. We, we did at Westchester, we accelerated a runway project, for example, because we took advantage of, of, the, of, of the traffic, uh, you know, numbers almost halting to zero. Uh, and we were able to do that project in three weeks versus a period of, you know, eight weeks. Uh, and so there, there's that opportunity to do that because there's also lower procurement costs right now, lower construction costs. Uh, so you can actually, if you came into COVID, uh, pre-COVID with, with facilities constraints, then this is the moment to, to actually prepare so that when traffic comes back, um, you're, you, you, can, you can actually have that infrastructure ready uh, because otherwise those, those problems are going to be there. They're not going to go away. Right now, everybody's kind of in la-la land, but, but, uh, but at the end of the day, too, is, is, is has to do with you know, prioritizing you know, uh, ca- uh, cash, but, uh, but at the same time, if, if those are constrained, then uh, as John and Frank had said, you know, there's, there's availability of, of, of uh, private sector uh, uh, investors that, that are willing to, to take the risk now uh, because they know that when, when traffic comes back, uh, you know, they're able to recover that, not only recover that investment, but actually make a, a good return, but allows the public sector to actually be prepared uh, with the infrastructure that they need when that traffic comes back. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I mean, I've, I've witnessed this firsthand, right? So, um, you know, so at LAX, the first thing that happened was tightening of the belt strings, storing up shoring up their financial position you know we saw hiring freezes we saw you know uh consulting uh contracts stopped we saw really just sort of a you know let's just put a freeze on everything that was sort of step one and then step two was to work with the the concessionaires and the the stakeholders the airlines the 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 food concessionaires and others to keep them solvent and to keep them from you know to keep them keep the lights on basically is what it was and uh and so now i think they're beginning to sort of shift into stage three which is getting people to feel safe about returning to the airport and uh there are a number of measures that are taking place at airports across the country uh in that regard to try and prepare for um for the next phase of sort of coming out of all this i think the airports have a realization that there's a new normal and they're not going to be able to do business uh, as they have in the past but i think there's not real clarity as to what that means and so i think that uh, creates the opportunity for us on the private side to help show them how uh, in partnerships with uh, private sector capital and expertise that they can create a new way of doing business Get people back to the airport, get people back to work again, and uh, and I think um, this has created an opportunity for us to really um, be part of this re- post-COVID recovery. And I think there are airports across the country beginning to to open up to that. So it's it's a new normal. It's a recognition that we can't do business the way we have in the past, 
but still sort of an open landscape as to what that means. And that creates opportunity for us. And I think, you know, it might've been touched on a, a minute ago, but there's always a fear of the unknown in the airport world and the airport administrations. Um, status quo rarely gets people in trouble. And so it's really hard sometimes to break into new models and new approaches. I think there's, you know, recognition now that they have to, but, um, but it's up to us on the private side to help sort of guide the airport authorities and their commissioners as to where we all need to go in order to make this, uh, this work. Um, last thing I'll say on sort of the recovery piece is there are a lot of projects that have been put on hold um, because they're not core to helping the airlines and the core concessioners and they're not core to getting people back to work and addressing safety and sanitation, things like that. I'm talking about, you know, solar projects, sustainability projects, some of the some of the grander initiatives that airports across the country had. And these represent opportunities, I think, for the private sector to be able to show the airport how they can, you know, resume some of the things that were just put on a lower priority over the last several months through a more collaborative partnership with uh, with the private sector. Great. Thanks. Greg, I'd like to add one thing on the future, the new airports. This uh, facial recognition thing, uh, I think it's going to be a game changer. Uh, they're talking now about speeding up the, the wait before you can uh, uh, actually board the aircraft by cutting uh, from the time that you walk into the airport itself, uh, cutting that down by 50%. And uh, that's a, you know, for those of us who, have to get it takes us an hour and a half to get to the airport and then it takes another hour and a half to two hours to get on the plane uh, when you see a uh, something like that the technology that can speed this process up uh, I think it's going to have a huge impact uh, particularly on the consumer side uh, of rail but also on the security side of the freight you know there's huge technological jumps going on too to protect the uh, uh, to protect the freight as it comes in off an aircraft and, and where it goes and how fast do you get it out of the aircraft uh, into the hands of the person who actually ordered it, you know, much less going to a local warehouse or, or something of that nature. So the technology is going to have a huge impact. And for those people who are kind of down in the dumps by all this, um, all you have to do is look back in the last 10 to 20 to 30 years when there's been a huge drop off and uh, sooner and later the technology comes in and opens up so many opportunities that you'd just be crazy now to uh, say, well, I'll, I'll wait till it's all over with and then, then I'll kick myself because of all the opportunities that I missed. Great, thanks. So um, I have a, another question and I'm gonna to turn to the audience questions here. So my last question here is, you know, the ownership structure of airports in the U.S. is 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 generally owned by local governments with varying governance structures. So just as a general commentary on where you think local and the local and federal government, what what they can do to help accelerate more private investments. Uh, I'll start with you again, Jorge. Sure, I think I, it, it starts I would throw out. Oh, Local people should allow the private developers, if they want them to come in and be members of the family, they've got to give them a chance to make a good return. Right. No, I agree with you, Frank. And, um, you know, as, as, as you were, one of the things that uh, you were speaking earlier is about educating uh, kind of the authorities and the staff of, of the benefits of, of private sector innovation. John touched about, you know, some of the misconceptions there is. Um, and so the federal government needs to take a little more leadership around that and can facilitate a lot of those discussions so that it, it can also allow the, 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 the challenge that we have in this country is that the majority of the all the airports, majority of the airports are under uh, local ownership. And so every owner over local municipality is trying to figure this out. But if we can come up with a common standard and sort of frameworks and, and one's the FAA IPP, but that's not just enough, right? Because that doesn't that that doesn't apply to every every uh, airport, and it doesn't work for every airport. Uh, the challenges of the FAA IPP is it gives the the airlines a lot of decision making, and 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 that's and 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 also 
it, it's, a, it's a long drawn out process. So uh, I think that's one vehicle they can use, but the other one is, is to really uh, bring in kind of helping align a lot of the stakeholders, uh, giving you know resources to local uh, municipalities and, and, and authorities to uh, be able to uh, define a, a clear process, give them certainty to, to the investors and, and the bidders uh, that they're going to uh, uh, be able to uh, able to transact and and, and have that that uh, backing. Um, also, there's airports where uh, the risk is too high, and so maybe the, the the federal government can provide some kind of guarantees uh, that allows the 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 local airports to uh, one a uh, reduce that risk uh, that there's a sometimes a mismatch between risk and reward. For the private investor, so reduce that risk so that there's it matches and attracts uh, and makes that uh, investment more profitable. Uh, and it just can be just a, a guarantee. And then also maybe with with traffic, uh, helping kind of some of the the, the airports with uh, minimum minimum guarantees. So this is kind of some of the role, and and a lot of it is is intangibles. Uh, but but at the same time, uh, I think the federal government can can actually do more uh, than than it has done in in the past. So. I mean, I think the um, I think the airports that I've been involved with have very much appreciated the federal support over these last several months uh, through the CARES Act and other uh, other um, opportunities to generate some some much needed infusion. Uh, and certainly, the uh, stakeholders, the airlines, and the concessionaires are benefiting from that as well. I think for for me, the key is try to get people back to work as quickly as possible and so to the, and i don't think this is the role of the federal government but certainly at the state level and maybe the city level to be able to to help accelerate the traditional procurement processes and truncate those into a way that projects can be uh, approved and green lighted uh, at a much quicker pace uh, which the private sector is ready to help uh, do i think is going to be um, really an area where the airport authorities can benefit from from government action. They may not do it on their be able to do it on their own, but if a city or state can come in and help them through showing precedents through certain acts to um, to accelerate this uh, process, I think it works uh, all around for the all the way down to the to the workers. Um, the um, yeah, I'll I'll stop there. Great, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that, Greg, if I can just add to John's yeah, point yeah. about accelerating procurement. You know, the biggest end, end of, the, of the poll, especially in infrastructure projects, is around the environmental process. So if there's any way to streamline that, uh, that, that'd be helpful because it could, I, I was talking to a township, not going to name names. It took them seven years if they did an environmental impact assessment, you know, and so that, that's like seven years, you know, for, for what, you know, so uh, by the time you, you, you're ready to build, it's, it's a completely different world, right? So last seven years has changed. So uh, we, we need to get, uh, agree with John that, that things need to uh, be accelerated. And uh, my only, my only, I guess, the difference with, with John is that I think the, the local the issue with local municipalities is they just don't have the resources, those budgets, their budgets have been cut so much that even when trying to get with the, the people that can manage those processes, uh, the, those departments have been reduced, the public works departments, the local municipalities, and, and then two, they, don't, they just don't have the, the wherewithal or, or even the, the, the monies to, to, to do that. So that's why I think the, the federal government uh, needs to step in. And, and I think I agree with you that uh, the CARES Act has been uh, super helpful, but, but, but I'm, 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 starting, I'm looking more uh, how we get through this uh, on the long term. Uh, the measures that you mentioned are definitely agree with you over the, the short term are very applicable too. Yeah, so this is this is a related question and it's from the audience, but um, it, I think it's timely. In the context of the upcoming elections, what are some priorities you would want the next administration to initiate in supporting to drive P3s and the airport infrastructure forward? Frank, do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, the uh, a lot of both in the Obama administration and in the last three years, there's been a lot of work to speed up the environmental process. Uh, there are a couple of great stories from pre what President Obama did 
to get the dredging on the three southern ports uh, to get that done quicker. There's now a dashboard system uh, where uh, infrastructure projects can be monitored, and there seems to be a growing consensus uh, outside some of the agencies that this process has to move faster. And the dashboard, just one example of it. I was told of a conversation that President Obama had with uh, some folks on this port thing, and they said, I want an EIS in the year on my desk, and if you can't give it to me, I'm gonna find somebody else that can. And he got it. And that was the, the Republican administration, the dashboard thing is all built on that premise that this process takes way too long uh, and it's stifling ec economic revival. Um, so there is stuff in place, but as Norm in one of his columns in Forbes magazine said, uh, if there's a permitting process and the local communities are for the project, then they have to be part of your team to put pressure so that nobody's trying to cut back on the work that has to be done. It's the timing of the work that has to be done. If it can be done in three months, great. If that three months gets stretched out to nine because of, quote, other demands, that's where the whole system falls apart. So I, I've told my local people, uh, you know, who all say they're behind this, and they said, you gotta help us. You know, if you gotta get the Congresswoman and you gotta get the state reps and you gotta say, what's the status? And you have to go to the agencies and when are these reports due? And if they don't come in when they're supposed to be due, then you go the next day and say why and what's going to be scheduled. And then you put pressure for people to honor their commitments. That's all we're asking here. Honor your commitments. Uh, you know, and I could go on forever on this one. <laughs> all right. I think we have time for one last question. Um, and I'll throw it out to the panel. Uh, just volunteer who, you want, who wants to take it. How can we plan for sustainable aviation growth? Well, it's a fuel question, you know, that if uh, the airplanes use diesel and a lot of people think that's not a sustainable energy source or I'm uh, not, not diesel, aviation gas. Um, but, uh, you know, the, if you want to, if you want to have electric planes or natural gas planes or whatever, I think the big, the bigger question is not the aircraft, but the facilities that support the aircraft the the uh, uh, the trucks at the airport, the passenger movers, the transit going in and out of the airport, the highways going in and out of the airport. Those are the easiest things to do. And you can actually have measurable progress if you set out a campaign to do that. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's a group of folks and I think they're terrific. I'm an ex-pilot, uh, although just uh, with small airplanes. And, uh, you know, well, I can, my, this plane flew on solar power. Well, that's great. You know, can you carry 300 passengers, you know, and uh, that kind of stuff. But um, one of the things that I learned when I was running my software firm is that once a platform is adopted by the public and by the industry, you are going to be amazed at how fast the applications start coming out of that platform. And the facial recognition is a classic example of it. Once, once people said, hey, this can really speed up things, you know, whatever the concerns are, as long as they're managed, let's go. And now all of a sudden it's starting to show up in places that never thought that they would have it. And I think in air, airport maintenance, and you folks are a lot more qualified than I am to talk about this, but the sustainability could start with the maintenance operations and go from there. I think that's right. I mean, I think that the needle's going to get moved, Greg, uh, or whoever asked the question, on the ground more so than on the air. It's going to come in the form of the facilities, and it's come and it's going to come in form of the equipment that supports the uh, the aircraft. The um, the um, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> the um, the, the, focus on, the, focus on, the focus on sustainability, I think, is not going away. I think it's only going uh, to going to continue. But I, I think it's going to come, like I said, on the ground uh, and, and more so than in the air itself. 
Yeah, if I would just add, um, I, I agree with both of you, and I, I just think that you know it's germane to this this discussion is by pri having private sector uh, involvement and investments uh, allows to adapt, and I think we're we've shown to be a very resilient sector and adaptable, and and I think the 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 changes that are coming up, you know, I remind people ten years ago, you know, Uber and Lyft didn't exist, and that's completely disrupted industries, but we're going to see a lot of disruption. In, in this in this industry and and having flexible facilities flexible processes remote use of more technology that's the only way we're going to be able to adapt because we don't know what's going to change but we know something's going to change security is going to change safety is going to change the aircraft's going to change we're going to see ev tolls in the future that's going to happen urban taxis uh, electrical hydrogen is coming right so there's going to be this the, the areas of sustainability in terms of uh of, of that side I, I have no doubt that's going to be but are we as a sector can how can we be flexible and adaptable great well i think we've run out of time but i want to thank you john frank and jorge this is a great discussion and thank you for the audience for for listening